So thank you very much for having me along today. Just check that I've um, got my screens all. It's a delight to be here, and I, I must say uh, I'm feeling a little intimidated, not because you look like a tough jury, although some of you do, uh, but I watched Julia Marsh give her talk, um, uh, the paediatrician, uh, uh, watched her online to see what competition I was up against. And she had PowerPoints and graphs and slides and pictures of cute kids. And I thought, I can't compete with that. But I did think, against my better judgment, usually I'd, I'd, I'd run out a few PowerPoints as well. So here we are. Um, so, does God love lawyers? That's to the title of today's talk. Well, does he? When I, you sort of talk about being a Christian lawyer, you kind of, or indeed being a lawyer, you kind of get a range of reactions. And some, from one end, there's a sort of a chortle. Uh, even John was telling me his best lawyer jokes, even just before we got started. And, and through to the other end, there is hatred, quite literally hatred. And to, just to tell you um, a few stories about that. Um, I remember when I was a, an undergraduate student, and... Uh, I was mentioning to one, another student that I was off to a meeting of uh, uh, young Christian lawyers. And he laughed like a drain. He said, isn't that a contradiction in terms? And that does something to some 20-year-old 20 20 year kid. And it, you, you get the message that something I'm doing is immoral here. I googled, this was a mistake, I, t I turned over a stone I wish I'd never turned over. I, I, I googled lawyer jokes. And I, a, I'm not good at telling jokes, but there was a throbbing vein of, uh, of material there. And one of the earlier ones I came across is this. And I will read it in a pa deadpan manner. As I say, I can't tell jokes. Lawyer says to the judge, my lord, I wish to appeal my client's case on the basis of newly discovered evidence. Judge, and what is the nature of the new evidence? Lawyer, my lord, I've just discovered that my client still has £5,000 left with which to pay me more fees. <laughs> so we learn that lawyers are parasitical. Winston Churchill, you've always got to r pull out Winston Churchill. Let me get rid of this. He was no friend of lawyers, or no friend to lawyers. Uh, lawyers, he said, occasionally stumble across the truth but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. So lawyers are untruthful. And in the media, well, we've only just got to stare for a moment at the post office scandal and think what on earth was going on? All these postmasters and mistresses getting on with their working lives and then they find themselves accused of fraud and some of them imprisoned. Um, and, in fact, we discover now there's a faulty computer system at the heart of it. And there were lawyers all over the place throughout the process. And did, did nobody say, hold on a minute, where is the justice here? What is fair? What is true? And so we can get the impression from that that lawyers there were just guns for hire. And then finally... Um, I've had this two or three times. I, I met a doctor, a Christian doctor, and you know, we, did, we talked about what you do and shared a, and so on. Um, and he looked at me in earnest and said, I hate lawyers. And he wasn't joking. I was a bit of a conversation stopper. Um, and it's because he'd been sued. He'd been sued. I was at a wedding once, and I, uh, you know, on these round tables for the reception afterwards, found myself sat next to a policeman, and, you know, what do you do? And I said, honestly, I nearly, I nearly had to ask to be moved table. He just went on and on and on about, you know, all the things he hates about lawyers. So, um, the question is at large, what do we think of lawyers, and what does God think of lawyers? Well, what I'm going to try and do uh, today is to introduce myself, give you a little bit of my background so you know things about me, to try and answer that question uh, and then invite questions from you. And I'll say this now and I'll say it again at the end. I would really encourage the most impolite, impertinent, um, to the point questions at the end. That makes it more fun. Okay. So just go for it. So my own background. So I was 
called to the bar in 1993. And just to, to use that, just to be clear what the difference is between a barrister uh, and a solicitor. Um, well, the, actually, the terms and what people do is really very overlapping now. So the terms are, are, are quite imprecise. But generally, a barrister is a person who will uh, do the advocacy in court and um, provide advice, specialist advice, in probably niche areas uh, and often that advice is related to litigation. The solicitor, by contrast, will, many will not go to court and they'll do everything from conveying your house to arranging the sale of a multi-billion dollar um, uh, business. Uh, they have an incredibly wide uh, remit, if you like, and will cover areas from crime, family, civil, commercial, you name it. Um, both areas, but the barrister tends to be in court, the solicitor tends to, to not be. So I got called in 1993, um, so that was the beginning of my practice. But I think there's probably over the years, that was a long time ago, three themes to my career. So there's a, that of a lawyer, there's that as a lecturer. So back in the late 2000, uh, just before around the millennium, um, the, a bar course opened up in Nottingham when I was working there and I started doing some guest lecturing and discovered I absolutely adored lecturing and over time transitioned into being an academic uh, and then over the years uh, developed the, that side of things until I became, I set up and became the dean of, of, of a law school here in London. And then the third string to my bow, which has been probably the last dozen years, has been, if you like, a leader. Um, so I, my job title is Director of the Council of the Inns of Court. Now what that means is that I, on behalf of the Inns of Court, and I'll explain this a bit more in a minute, I, um, re I represent them to government, so I'll go to the Ministry of Justice and talk to the Secretary of State about things about training and codes of conduct and anything to do with practicing as a lawyer. Uh, training, deliver lots of training, so set up a new bar school, do practitioner training, uh, if there are areas of need where there hasn't been training before, such as how to handle vulnerable witnesses, we create those training materials and train the profession in it. And then the less glamorous side of what I do is discipline. So I run the tribunals. I don't, I don't sit as the judge, but I run the service uh, that, dis that decides whether naughty barristers have been naughty, whether they need to be disbarred or, or some other sanction. So there's those three elements to, to my role. Well, the Inns of Court, of which uh, you know, I'm the di director of the council, the collective body. So we have this central body, and there are four of them, and they're absolutely amazing. I love them to bits. So just to show you some pictures, this is Middle Temple, and this is their hall. Uh, we've got four, four halls where we can go and have our lunch that look uh, some variant or other of that, rather nice. Um, this is, in this hall, they say that, uh, 12, that uh, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night had its um, first performance there. Gray's Inn, so we've got four gardens in central London. This is a, Gray's, a corner of Gray's Inn Garden, it's beautiful. So if I don't want to be in hall for my lunch, I can go and get a sandwich and uh, eat it there. Uh, Lincoln's Inn Library, this is a library of cathedral proportions. Uh, it's absolutely vast with sort of three heights of, of book stacks uh, uh, going through. And there we have uh, Temple Church. We have three churches, one at Gray's Inn, one at Lincoln's Inn, and one shared by Middle and uh, Temple uh, and Inner Temple. And Temple Church is absolutely beautiful. Um, fantastic place. And I go to Even Song fairly regularly there. Um, and as I say, it's shared between Middle Temple and Inner Temple. And, and I mean that literally. There is a line down the middle, and to the south of the line, let me get this right, is Inner Temple, and to the north of the line uh, is Middle Temple. And if you die and want your ashes kept at the church, with, there are little cubby holes for it, depends which inn you were a member of, where your ashes get put either side of the line. Um, so that's Temple Church. Now this is all uh, really rather beautiful. Uh, the main purpose, the main modern purpose, and why I really enjoy working with them, is what we do is basically support people into the profession. So we give out about eight million pounds in scholarships a year to help people from the widest diversity of backgrounds we can uh, to enter the profession. 
Um, I love working there. It's a very, very pressured environment to work in, as you can imagine. I have quite a few people with quite a, quite a lot of egos, shall we say, uh, and um, they're not shy in sharing their opinions with me. So that's the world in which I, I spend my days. So, back to the question. Does God love lawyers? Now, this is the reveal slide. Is it a yes or is it a no? Well, you, as you can predict. It's a yes. <laughs> now, I'm going to be a bit provocative. I'm going to say more than a yes. And I'm both being provocative and entirely sincere. God's heart leaps with joy at the very idea of lawyers. God adores lawyers. <laughs> God delights in lawyers. The very smell of a lawyer is a beautiful fragrance to God. I've set myself a high bar. But why does God love lawyers? Because he loves you. Put another way, I think lawyers are literally God's gift to you. Okay, so that's my case. So, if I were in court and I was trying to seek to persuade you as a judge, this is how I would open the case. So I'd stand up in front of the judge and I'd adjust my wig, hutch my robe back up, Scratch my bum, I'm ready to go, okay? May it please your honour, in this matter I appear on behalf of the applicant and my learned friend Mr Smith appears on behalf of the respondent. And today, your honour, I will seek to persuade you that God loves lawyers because he loves you, he loves us. And your honour, I have four submissions that I will structure uh, what I have to say around. That God invented laws, that God blessed lawyers, that God calls you as all to do justice and that God rescues us from our own injustices. So that's the way in which you open a case. You outline the proposition you're seeking to persuade them of, what are the main planks, and then you work through it. So let's look at this. God invented lawyers. Um, the first scripture there is from Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now notice what you have there. You have two laws. There are two laws contained in those verses. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. That's a law, a permissive law, a license. And you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's a restrictive law, a prohibition. So you've got permission and a prohibition. You've got two laws. But what's interesting to note here, I think, is this is before the fall. So we're still in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had not eaten, eaten from the apple. We're still in the created divine order. And so what we learn from that is that in fresh creation, um, that law is good. Law is intrinsically good. Now you know that and you experience that. With your children and loved ones, you will teach them at an early age that they must not touch the fire. That's a household law. Um, you must not go near the cooker. You set a law for your environment because you love them. And this is what God was doing here, telling them what they could and what they couldn't do, because he loved Adam and Eve. Now, in some ways, we may take that for granted. Now, I want to mention a book. I don't know if you, any of you know about the author and broadcaster called Tom Holland. Uh, there's a, uh, a podcast called The Rest is History. Okay, and Tom Holland is not a Christian, but this book, Dominion, uh, he's, a, he's an historian, an academic historian. 
Um, his whole thesis is, is that, um, that Christianity is good because it introduced a whole regime of laws that we assume to be the case, but in fact are the direct results of the teachings of Christ, the letters of Paul, um, and the teachings of the church through history. And without it, we would be in a very different place where we couldn't assume property rights and couldn't assume um, rights of protection to our person in the way that we do now. So his whole thesis is that Christianity is built us uh, in a way that uh, we don't necessarily appreciate it. And you will have experienced that if ever you purchased your house. And you'll know you've had to go, go through a conveyance and it's a bit of a pain and it takes too much time and it costs too much money and all the rest of it. But what that conveyance does, what that contract to buy and sell land, land what that registration of the land has done, is just, you've just walked through an incredible legal process which gives you peace and quiet and enjoyment and love and security. It surrounds you in a nest. And that's just the law in operation. Without it, you would be subject to the person who's strongest, who comes along and decides they want your property. <coughs> now you go, oh, no, that wouldn't happen. But it does. I spent a lot of time in East Africa working as law, and people just take property. There is the law, but nobody applies it. They take it. In fact, the government, government ministers will come and acquire land unlawfully, and nobody can do anything about it because they have the guns. But law, well operated, um, is a blessing. The next verse, I'm, if I'm any good today, come back in a few weeks' time because I'm preaching on this uh, here at St. Paul's later in, in the term, is from Psalm 119. And I won't quote the whole psalm, but it, it's a, a hymn. It's a hymn of praise to good law. Your statutes are wonderful. Your words give light. I have a longing for your commands as the deer pants for the water type stuff. I, I'm directed according to your word. I obey your precepts. Teach me your decrees. Your law, Lord, is perfect. So statutes, words, commands, words, precepts, decrees, all these words for descriptive words of law. And, uh, and the author is thirsty for it. He longs for it. He longs for good law because they sustain him. They give him wholeness and peace. So I think that good law is amazingly good. It's delightfully good. Now let me give you an example from an early years, years of practice. Uh, I've mentioned this before when I've been preaching, uh, but one of the first things you learn as an undergraduate law student is about criminal law. And this is the definition of theft. Um, this is section one of the Theft Act 1968, just a month old, six months older than me. Uh, a person is guilty of theft if he dishonestly appropriates property belonging to another with the intention of permanently depriving the other of it. Every law student, every police officer, um, you know, will learn this as sort of day one stuff. Now, I was sent in my early years to the magistrate's courts to do a plea in mitigation on behalf of a young man. Plea in mitigation is where the person has pleaded guilty to the offence, and now you need to seek to persuade the court to give us a lower sentence within the range of sentences available as possible. And so I went to, I can't remember where it was now, but to, to this court and met this young man who was terrified, absolutely terrified. What had happened, he was a, uh, a student and he'd, this is in the early days of computers, and he'd, um, uh, uh, he'd been accused of stealing a computer from a friend of his. And he wanted to plead guilty, he wanted to get it out of the way, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we picked through what had happened and I advised him, you're not, you, what you're telling me, I think you need to plead not guilty. Because in essence, what he was saying is that he had been under the impression, and there'd been a lot of a drink involved in this situation, that his friend had said he could use his computer, the, the friend's computer, for a year. And so he'd gone back another time, taken the computer back to his room, and, and was indeed using it. 
And so what I was able to do is then, could, because of law, I could pick through the de definition. Was it dishonest? No. Did he appropriate it? Yes. Was it property belonging to another? Yes. With the intention of permanently depriving the other of it? No. And if any one of those elements of the offence fail, then you're not guilty of an offence. And so I said to him, I think you should plead not guilty. It's a matter for you. And so in the end, he pleaded not guilty. We had a little trial, and he was found not guilty. And again, the point is here, is that he and I and the magistrates could operate in the security of a framework of law. Okay? So God had given us a gift of law, and here I was, to, um, all those years later, applying law uh, to, to serve and support somebody. So that was my first one. God uh, gave us the gift of law, and my, th my next way of persuading you is that God blessed lawyers. Now, I went to, uh, to Inner Temple, uh, sorry, to the Temple Church, to a most amazing memorial service for the late Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, a, a chap who's appropriately called Igor Judge, judge by name, judge by nature. And he was one of the most lovely men I've ever, ever meet, met. My experience is the more senior they are, the easier they are to deal with, the, these, uh, the judges. And uh, this is one of the readings that was uh, uh, from the funeral, uh, from Deuteronomy. And uh, the, um, sorry, let me give you context. So it, Moses and Joshua and the tribe are on the eve, if you like, of going into the promised land. Moses will not go into the promised land, but Joshua will. And so Joshua and the people are being instructed before they go in in how to run the promised land. And the promised land is, at that moment in time, is as close to heaven as you can get, if you sort of mean heaven on earth, at that point in history. And so this, through the prophets, uh, through, through Moses, is what Joshua and the people are told. Appoint judges and officials for each of your tribes in every town the Lord your God has given you. They shall judge the people fairly. Do not pervert the course uh, uh, pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. Follow justice and justice alone so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. So that you may live. So we're getting, imagine I'm coming along, I'm giving, right, just take, we're going to go over there. Uh, and I'm going to give you instructions for heavenly living. Okay? Um, one of the things that God instructed was about appointing lawyers. Now, we have to be careful. A judge in those times was not quite a judge that we would imagine in these times, but it's not far off. It's good enough a paradigm for us. And so, again, the point is that lawyers and, uh, are there because they help implement the law. So he's given his law, and he's given his lawyers to put it into practice. And it's not a theoretical thing. It's so that you may live. So going back to your house, you enjoy living in your house because of law, and if it goes wrong, we can bring in lawyers to put it right. And in there, we've got a code of practice for judges and lawyers. Don't pervert justice, don't accept a bribe, follow justice and justice alone. So let me give you another example from uh, you know, the everyday life, my everyday life as a lawyer and, and, and of many lawyers. Um, this is the Children Act, 1989. And this is invoked a thousand times a day in the courts across the land. When a court determines any question, the child's welfare shall be the court's paramount consideration. So that's the big principle. What's best for the child? What's just for the child? Okay. And then the section three, a court shall have regard, and I've abridged this, a court shall have regard to a particular, the wishes of the child, the needs uh, uh, of the child, the effect of change, the background, any harm they have suffered or like to suffer, and how capable each of the parents are. What, notice what's not, not in there. I'm getting, allowing to, to myself to get distracted. What is not in there is who is at fault in the breakup of the relationship between the parents. Don't even ask that question in most circumstances. It's the welfare of the child is the only question we're addressing. So that's the law, okay? 
So one day I pitched up to represent a dad from estranged parents and a bitter divorce, and it's generally barristers get involved when there is bitterness in, in, in the situation. Um, he wanted the kids, when you say wanted, he wanted the kids to live with him, and mum, uh, with whom the kids were living at that time, wanted them to stay with her. And I advised him, so I'd got lots of information from the solicitors about him, and because of the Children Act, I could walk through this and give him my opinion and my advice, law by law by law, on what I thought was going to happen, the judge would decide. And my advice to him was that it was very unlikely that he would get the kids living with him. He got very cross, um, extremely cross with me. Um, he didn't hit me, which has happened before, um, but uh, very cross. And he instructed me in no uncertain terms to go into court and to fight, fight, fight to get the kids. Do you know what I did? I went into court and I fought, fought, fought to get the kids. You see, my role at that moment is not to be the judge. My role is to advise my client on what I think the outcome would be and what the best approach might be, therefore, and I was advising we should negotiate. Um, and then to receive instructions from the client and present his case in the way he wants it doing, if he w it, it, the way he would do it, if you like, if, if he could do it to the best of his ability. So I'm to be his mouthpiece saying what he wants. Okay, so I'm to amplify and advocate for his wishes. I'm not to replace his wishes. Now, I do that knowing the rules of evidence, knowing my code of ethics, and there are restrictions on what I can do and I can't do. But I fight, fight, fight for him, okay, in, in those circumstances. And we went in, and we did the biz, and at the end of the, the day, the judge ruled as I knew, I suspected would happen, and the father did not get the children living with him. We had a regime of contact with the children. Now, equally, I've given very similar advice in similar circumstances, gone into court, fought the case, having advised my client they're not going to win, and then I see the witnesses for the other side. I think, actually, do you know what? I think my client was right. I think the other side are going to be unimpressive, etc., etc., and it goes the other way. You know, every, any lawyer will tell you that many, many times that you have one view before the hearing and you're not surprised that you're surprised during, as it were. So that's a thousand times a day. But what's happening here is that, that the role of law and then the role of the lawyer is, is a blessing because I could advise him from the Children Act I could do my best, and it wasn't might is right, it wasn't who can punch hardest gets the kids, it was what is the welfare of the children, becomes the determinative question. So, that's my second thing. So God loves lawyers because he invented law, because he blessed lawyers. And my third thing I want to say is this, that he calls you to do justice. Now, I'm a member of a body called the Lawyers Christian Fellowship. And this is their motto verses, uh, if you like. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, I was delighted when I watched Julia Marsh's uh, talk about uh, being a, a, a doctor uh, that she quoted this verse as well. Because whilst um, it might look like a verse for lawyers, it's not. It's a law verse for everybody. It's an injunction to us all to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And I think there's a very real sense in that um, we're all lawyers. You're a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, I may have a wig, and I may have a badge and you know funny clothes, um, but in essence, uh, we're, we're all lawyers. So God is instructing you to act justly. And you know that. You know that um, you know right and wrong. And that you know that in dealing with your family, your neighbours and your clients, you 
uh, either do do justice or or certainly call to do justice. So you don't cheat, you don't lie, you don't gossip, and so on. And that's because you have an understanding of the law. You have an understanding of the law of the land, but you have an understanding of the moral law, if you like, of, of what we've been taught through the Bible. So every one of us, you and I, are all justice practitioners. So when we ask the question, does God love lawyers, we are asking the question, well, does he love me? And that's why I say yes. He delights in all of us. But as being a lawyer of this broadest sense, we are called to act justice, but also called to love mercy. And so you're uh, asked, as it were, sometimes when you've got a right... You, you, you know, somebody does owe you £100, for whatever reason, sometimes the merciful thing is not to enforce that, not to go for it. The merciful thing is to not apply the law. That's a very complex area about when you don't apply the law. But we know that, as, that sometimes we have to be merciful for a greater good. And we're called to be humble. We're called, you are called to walk humbly before God and not before other people. Lawyers struggle with that one in particular. Okay. Now, you'll know this is a complex area in life because what that doesn't mean as a Christian is that you're to be a doormat. You know, if anyone does anything wrong, it's like, oh, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. It's fine. I'm fine. So sometimes in those complex situations, we have to both, um, if you like, be merciful, not decide to exact our vengeance but also report them to the police you know there's a civil wrong or criminal wrong going on here and, and you can do both at the same time I I'd do something actually um, you're most welcome no it's a most welcome interlude I'm sure so, um, the, I think forgiveness is one of the hardest things. So somebody may have done wrong to you, and one of the interesting things to work through is, are you called to forgive them? And for many of us, in, 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 what, in the criminal context or whatever, um, forgiveness is very often a very long-term process, and you may not have it within you. Uh, but, but helping people work through the fact that the forgiveness can eat away, at, lack of forgiveness can eat away at themselves. Anyway, I slightly digress. But what we do know are is that we're to be just, merciful, and humble as legal practitioners, all of us. And the most amazing thing is this. Um, we'll get it wrong. Every lawyer I know is imperfect. And every one of you, I'm guessing, is imperfect. And what's going to happen every day of the week is that um, you may try to love God and walk humbly and do justice and so on, but you won't get it right. You'll sin. You'll, you'll, You'll... slip below getting things absolutely right. And that might be because you're just not very good at stuff. That might be because of the circumstances. It might be because of the going back generations has brought you to that point. But there's this great passage. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Another way of describing sin is doing injustice. Every sin is an injustice. Every sin is doing something that is not just, is not the right thing. Okay? Okay. And the great thing about this passage for all of us, lawyers of one hue or another, is that um, we know that we're all 
God knows that. Whether you're in prison, whether you're sitting on the bench judging prisoners, whether you're in the public gallery watching the thing go on, you're going to have sinned, and God knows it, and God has got a way through. Um, and I just think that's incredible. I could get quite amazing about it, you know, quite emotional about it. You see, when we look to the cross, we know that it's a place of sacrifice. But the cross is the ultimate symbol of the place of justice. It was intended by those who killed Jesus, if you like, to be uh, injustice. So he was killed for what he wasn't deserved. Judgment was executed when it shouldn't have been. But we know because of God's greater plan that a divine and eternal justice was taking place. That for all the wrong things you and I have done, Christ took the punishment on the cross that we may be justified and put right with God. And what we need to do is to come to him and say sorry for the wrong things we've done and daily commit to a fresh start. So, does God love lawyers? He does. He adores them like he adores all of us. But he does adore law and he does adore good offices of laws because they are his idea. He invented lawyers, he blessed lawyers, he calls everyone in this room to injustice, to do justice, and he rescues us all from our own injustices. I'm going to finish with a prayer. <clears throat> So let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in times of need. Amen. So um, that's me talking. I'm very happy to take questions. Yes. Okay, you've proven that God loves lawyers. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> but what about the lawmakers? Yes. Just, just, just like that. I mean, think about Henry VIII. He was a lawmaker, but he broke so many laws, he, he appropriated Hampton Court from Wolsey. He, he had lots of people killed. And there must have been lots of others. Yeah. So what happens when the lawmakers break the law? Lawmakers break the law. Mm. Yeah. So, so um, I think true for lawmakers is true for all of us. So I don't know Henry VIII's position before God on his deathbed. You know, so it's not for me to judge him, shall we say, to, to cast that judgment. But all it, um, there are bad laws as well as good laws. Okay. So it's not to say all law is good. And there are bad practitioners as laws um, as well as good practitioners of law. Um, uh, and I think we all face judgment in the same way. Um, uh, we all need to come to the throne of mercy. Yeah. Another question. Um. Graham. Um, I'm just wondering, when a jury finds uh, against a person and that person is found guilty but they were not guilty. How, does this happen very often, do you think? Okay. Um, so, um, it doesn't happen that often, or it's not found to have happened that often. So, almost all legal systems have a process of appeal. Uh, and within the criminal system, there are very many levels of appeal. And so um, somebody who's been found guilty can appeal that. Now, the grounds for it are, are restricted. Um, uh, but, and usually, the ground, you can't go behind a, jur a jury's decision. Um, one of the main reasons is, is that there is fresh evidence that, that you can usually overturn a jury's previous decision. Okay, that, that we now know things that we didn't... So Guildford 4, Birmingham 6... 
in fact, evidence came to light that should have been put to the jury in the first place and wasn't. So the basis of the appeal was, was later evidence that came to light. Um, so yes, it happens. We have, injust uh, we have imperfect justice at this stage. Uh, I don't think it happens a huge amount of times, but it, it will happen. And there are processes which sometimes, though not always, can sort it out. James, is, is there a case for, and I remember discussing this with my, my dear friend Richard Walker, of course, a retired judge, uh, and whether there is a case sometimes for having professional jurors, because the complex nature of some of these um, cases, like, for example, financial fraud and so on, is there a case for that? So, um, professional jurors. Well, we do have um, legion professional jurors. So, for example, magistrates... Uh, many magistrates' courts, instead of having three lay magistrates, will have a full-time uh, lawyer magistrate who will determine criminal sentences. So, so in that sense, we do have prof professional jurors in criminal matters already and have done for, oh, I don't know, however long. Um, in more complex cases where you might get um, a jury, I don't know, Ken, why don't you ask me another one? Um, the, the, the argument runs that, that sometimes some of the things are so complicated as financial, you know, f multinational frauds that, that, that a lay jury sitting for listening to it for six months it is not going to be able to follow all this forensic accounting stuff. I think there's probably something in that, yes. That's my opinion. However, I counter to that. I think the jury system is a very, very important constitutional thing, and I think you undermine it at your peril. Another question? Lucy. On a slightly lighter note, James, can you tell us the history behind the background of the phrase being called to the bar? Uh, well, mm, no, is the answer. <laughs> um, the, the inns can trace themselves to being about 800 years old, but they know we, they existed before that. And the term uh, of lawyer and barrister and so on have been evolving terms uh, over, over time. Um, and you had different off legal officers than you have now. So you used to have role, uh, thing, we had something called sergeants in, which is a kind of an in for judges and things like that. And, um, uh, and so, so the terminology has evolved over time. But the concept of call to the bar is so we do have a ceremony um, where we call people uh, to the bar. Uh, and it's not literally to a bar anymore. It's not, it's not coming to, if you like, like you might have a communion rail in some churches, uh, but they used to be uh, bars. So you're coming to a, approaching a bar. And I think, what I think the beautiful distinction of that, as between, between that between that and a graduation, a graduation is finishing something, a call to the bar is starting something. And it's the point of which, in a sense, the professional responsibility, you're moving from a, being a student of the law to a professional practitioner of the law, um, you're investing them with responsibility. So that's probably as far as I can take it, Lucy. What do you do if you know that somebody's been dishonest to you when telling lies? How do you represent them? Yeah, so how do I represent somebody I know to be guilty type stuff? Okay. Um, right. So, so firstly is this, is that as a barrister, I'm under an obligation never to knowingly deceive a court. So I cannot lie on behalf of my client. If a client is accused of a crime or is and I'm having a conference with them and I'm working through it, I will evaluate the law with them and say, well, the police say this, the forensic evidence says that, and so on. Or, um, and I will then advise them, I think in the face of that, you are likely to be found guilty by the judge or the jury. So I can advise them on that. I, I might think they are, you know, 99% likely that this stinks, you're going to go down, mate, sort of thing. And in those circumstances, what I can do is advise them, and they can say... Uh, no, but I want to run a, guilty a not guilty trial, and I just get on with it, and I test the evidence for the other side. And I said, as I said earlier, sometimes you are surprised by how weak the other side's case is when you actually hear from other individuals. Okay. If my, so, so the point there is, I don't know they're guilty at that point. That, and that's not my job. 
My job is to advocate for them. And you let the judge and or the jury make that call. Okay. The exception to that is if my client comes in, and most are not stupid enough to say this in the criminal context, and says, I'm guilty, but I want you to get me off. Okay. <laughs> and I, at that point, have to say, well, I can't do that, because you've just told me you're guilty. Now, technically, what I can do is what's called testing the prosecution evidence. So it's always the burden is on the Crown, on the state, to prove somebody's guilty, not for somebody to prove they're innocent. Okay? So I can go in there, and I can't present to the court as if they're innocent, but I can say, well, that's for the, we're saying nothing for the moment. That's for the court to prove. They're, sorry, the Crown to prove. And I can let them run their evidence, and then I can make some comments on it. Well, that doesn't stand up, does it? And they've not done this, and they've breached that regulation, and so on. Uh, and, and see whether they can, they've actually got a case. So I can test the evidence, but I can't say they're not guilty. We'll present evidence which suggests they're not guilty. But that's a sort of a technical defence. But if somebody says that they're not guilty, uh, sorry, they're guilty, uh, and then um, uh, that, that's for them, that's their choice, uh, I can't represent them. And if they insist I represent them, I then I have to withdraw from the case. You've had a question, Brian. Let's have... Uh... <coughs> First of all, thank you very much for a wonderful insight. Justice is something we generally respect, and we're told that we should do justice. How far today, because of financial constraints, because of the cost, and I can imagine how much it's costing you to give your wonderful presentation this morning in terms of income lost, but we've gained so much, how far are finances actually prejudicing justice today? Okay, thank you. Um, and just to comfort you, I'm losing nothing because I'm an employee at the moment, so, you know. Um, I think finance, like, like the health sector, like the care sector, like the social services sector and so on, and the educational sector, I think uh, the financial situation is having an impact. Um, and the, the um, legal aid rates are so low that junior criminal barristers have found it impossible to make a living in recent times. Not all, but many junior criminal barristers and basically have either left the profession or have turned to other areas of work where they can make it pay. And it's like a business, it costs a lot to train. And if you train and then you get such a low income that you can't finance your debt, you have to get out. Um, and so what that, that has meant is that, uh, and the pandemic added to this, um, is that, that there are not enough, for example, there are not enough barristers who are <coughs> available uh, to prosecute and defend um, allegations of rape and serious sexual misconduct. And so the courts are the, the stacking up with unprosecuted cases. And defendants know that, in essence, that the longer that this runs on, the, the, the more and more delay there is into listing things, the more likely um, things will dissolve. You know, the, the, the prosecution won't be brought against them. Um, so I think the short answer is yes, is that the financial situation is having an impact on justice. Just at that end, but it washes back into because the police don't have all the resources they have uh, um, to investigate data on telephones properly. That, you know, bringing cases even to the point of getting prosecuted is, is, under, is under pressure. So, yes. I, and, and in a sense, it's, it's acute at the moment, but all justice is, is constrained by human constraints. And so justice remains as good as we can get it, but imperfect. Thank you, James. It's very interesting. Um, in your opening talk, you were the def um, barrister for the defence. I'm just wondering if you would have some words for the, prose for the prosecution, do you, the other side. Do you fo follow what I'm saying? Yeah, question? so um, in, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about crime. Actually, crime has always been on the... Uh, I'm, Never enjoyed criminal work that much, to be absolutely honest. I mostly did family and civil, um, but I did do crime. Um, 
And one of the great things about being at the bar, which I really, really enjoyed about it, and particularly was the case when I started out, is that one day you could be doing a criminal matter, the next a family matter, the next a, uh, an inquest, the next a boundary dispute with neighbours. You had such a smorgasbord of sort of insight into different areas of life and law. It was endlessly fascinating. Um, the other thing is that one day you may be for the prosecution, and the next, in another case, you could not in the same case, for the defence. And so you would practice both areas, and actually you learn your art better by sort of looking at it from both, uh, looking at generally at practice from both angles, and that's absolutely fascinating. In civil case, you may one day be bringing a claim, a, a, you know, a road traffic accident, you want to sue the, the, the other side, and the next day, in another matter, defending a claim. Uh, and so it's one of the great joys of the profession is you, 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 know, you switch angles from case to case. Um, yes, so, so and I think the, you know, the, the prosecution in particular the art of, is an art because what you need to do as a prosecutor is not persecute the defendant but present a fair, balanced um, ev uh, 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 account of the evidence so that a jury or a judge can make a fair decision. But you're not in there to persecute, you're there to fairly present the case. Thank, uh, James, thank you. Um, happily, we have a separation between state and the judiciary, but it could be thought that over the last few years in particular, the judiciary has ruled against the government's wishes. D could you say something about that? Yeah, so, the, so politicians get very vexed over some decisions that the courts make you know, and we can think of Supreme Court cases over Brexit and Rwanda and stuff like that uh, in, in, in recent times. So the, the, the principles of, of our Constitution, such as, as it is, is that, yes, you have the, the state is separate from the judiciary. So, the legis it, it, so you've got um, the executive is separate from the judiciary, um, but it's also separate, in a sense, from the lawmakers. Um, Parliament is supreme. So if Parliament enacts something, that is the law. Okay? And the way our Constitution works is that being the law, even the government is subject to the law. The, the government is not free to disregard the law. If there's a question about whether the government are acting lawfully or unlawfully, or legally, then... I can bring a claim against the government to say they are outside the law. They are requiring me to leave this country when they have no power to do so, because there is no law saying that they can do so. And so that comes before a court, and like any defendant, the government becomes, or the, 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 um, the, the executive becomes a defendant. And, and, and the courts have to interpret the law uh, and make a decision on whether they've been lawful or not. Now, it can be constitutionally vexed because sometimes the courts have to sort of fill in gaps which you'd rather was in the original legislation. Um, but, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it does work, but politicians absolutely hate it. Uh, thank, thanks, everyone, for your questions. Um, we are running out of time, and I'm sorry that we haven't been able to include everybody's questions by any means. If, you've got, if you're staying for lunch and you want to, you want to interview and whatever you want to do with a lawyer. Um, sit with James at lunch today. Um, the, um, so I'm going to, if you'll forgive the legal, I, I'm going to guillotine right at this moment. I want to say thank you uh, to James. What can I say? We give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.